I'm Amy Jo Martin. Welcome to the Why Not Now show. You know that thing you've been thinking about doing? Yeah, that one. Why not now? Have you ever actually taken the time to ask yourself, what's stopping me? Let's talk it through. This is your chance to give that idea the attention it deserves and take action. Each episode, I have a chat with a fascinating person from entrepreneurs to athletes, celebrities, my parents, rocket scientists, and all walks of life. We talk through a critical time when they've asked themselves, why not now? We dissect that day or even that moment, step by step. I'm gonna try a bit of an experiment and you're welcome to join me. Starting today, the day that this episode airs, I'm going to spend a week without social media, a social media cleanse, a detox. There will be zilch, nada, zero social media in my life for at least a week. It's not forever, but I do plan to kind of reset and come back to the game, come back to the scene with some new ground rules set. So I'll talk a little bit more about this on the flip side of this interview. Chris Birch is on the show today. He's the founder and CEO of Birch Creative Capital. He's also the co-founder of Tory Birch LLC, the fashion brand. He has partnered with Ellen DeGeneres to help her with her Ed by Ellen fashion apparel home goods brand. And Chris is just a creative wizard. He's been doing this a long time and he's invested in various companies along the way, all types of industries from technology to real estate, to, of course, fashion is his sweet spot. And we talk a lot about the creative process. We also talk about areas of focus that he has for future investments and industries that will be hot, in his opinion, and also just what happens when people come in and pitch him and sit across the table from him, how that goes down and uh, his process and how he vets potential entrepreneurs. Very valuable advice. Also, I asked him to share his pet peeves in that process, which he did. And Chris has been very successful in his career. He's a billionaire. Although he's, he's experienced that success, he was willing to share with me some of the challenges that he's faced along the way and really kind of get vulnerable and share insights with me. And that humility is something that I appreciate a great deal uh, because you don't have to necessarily. So that's to our benefit that we get to hear and learn Here's Chris. Most of you know that I'm a big Headspace fan. And if you're new to the show, just as some background, I started using the Headspace app about a year ago, and it's been the single best thing I've ever done for myself. Here's the thing, though. Sometimes meditation and mindfulness is not what we imagine. (laughs) Yes, there are days when I feel like I'm in a Zen situation, and other days I've been known to hit the SOS button. There's literally an SOS button on the Headspace app. So there have been times where I've removed myself from certain situations and gone somewhere to push this button. One time I even escaped my car. So this quick three-minute mind saver has kept me from falling down that rabbit hole in some way. Or even saying things I didn't mean, maybe texting or emailing something to someone that I didn't mean. It's like taking a breath of fresh air and it just allows me to reset. And as Jimmy Fallon, who uses the app, has even said, it's great. This British guy comes on, tells me it's going to be all right. In fact, the British guy, Andy, who's been on the podcast, comes on and says this when you hit the SOS button. Okay, so you've hit the SOS button. So there's a pretty good chance you're feeling pretty stressed right now. So to begin with, I'd just like you to find a place where you can sit down just for two or three minutes, completely undisturbed. 
So maybe you already meditate, maybe not, but you want to start. Regardless of the case, let's be real. Most of us don't have a Zen sanctuary with a fluffy pillow, mood lighting to retreat to when we're about to lose it. So now you can literally have an SOS button that you push. It's a three minute pause. Thanks to Headspace. There hasn't been a time when I've hit that button and it hasn't made me feel better. Welcome to the show, Chris Birch. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Good, good. I'm excited to have you on today and kicking right off in the spirit of why not now, is there a time that comes to mind? You you thought to yourself, I must ask myself, why not now, right now? And let's dissect it. Let's look at that day or that moment as detailed as we can and talk it through. I'll, I'll give you two, right? Uh, for a lot of your listeners, young listeners, I think when I was getting out of college uh, and I was selling sweaters door to door on college campuses with my brother, I didn't have two nickels to rub together. We had made a little bit of money and I went to my mom and dad, got a little bit more money and I decided my senior year of college, why do I want to go work for somebody else. And that was back in 1976 when nobody wanted to go on their own. I realized I had no money and I realized that the risk was crazy. But fortunately, I was on a bicycle in Scotland. I saw this little sweater factory and I said, why not now? Why don't I just get some money together, buy these Scottish sweaters and then go out, hire college kids around America and sell those sweaters door to door on college campuses and the girls will love them and I'll be able to maybe make some money, maybe make a living. And instead of going to work for Procter and Gamble, which I had a job offer, instead of going to IBM and all these companies and my mom and my dad were like, are you crazy? I huddled back into my parents' house. My warehouse was the third floor, our third floor playroom. And my brother and I went out and we sold sweaters door to door on college campuses and we had another job while we built the company. And what was it that turned you off so much about working for someone else? I mean, we can intuitively jump to to answers, but what was it that that really kept you from wanting to go work with IBM, go work with one of the companies that had provided offers to you? I you know, I think back then you have to think about I had a voice that was like, that was constantly saying, wow, the world is such a big place and there's so much opportunity. Why can't I do it? You know, um, I can do this. Why do I want to go to work and go into an office every day, collect a paycheck, put on a suit, pretend I'm a business person. And so as scared as I was, and my first shipment was not good. Uh, I said, I can do it. And I said that there's a huge opportunity for everyone in, in to, to sell. And I saw the need and I said, just do it. Take a risk. Awesome. And you did mention, and I, I saw your video with Deepak Chopra, and you've talked about being a child and having various learning disabilities and and just having your unique experience that you described listening to talk radio at night. So you were able to build this confidence, clearly, and having one of your first gigs out of the gate be being an entrepreneur yourself, uh, where did that confidence evolve? Or was it maybe the, the challenges in the beginning that led you to believing in yourself? Or do you have kind of a theory on that? So, so I, I think the fact that, uh, and I think a lot of your viewers, and I think we're finding out in life, struggle real struggle. And mine was real struggle because, you know, I, I couldn't sleep at night. I was caught nothing but straight F's builds an ability for you to look in a different way. Okay. So if you're terrible at school, you daydream. So what, what happened to me, my confidence was built by listening to the voices of Philadelphia at night, hundreds of people. And then being able, as I grew up to be able to use that learning in the most important time as a way to start a business or, or to do it. And that learning, that that critical period between these ages of seven and 14, when other kids were sleeping or they were doing their homework, I was listening to the creative voices of people. And I said to myself, you know what, I can do this. And the fact that I had probably had so much fear as a child actually helped me 
handle that fear and move ahead and put everything I had in the world, uh, which was very little, to start a business. Wow, that makes sense. And being exposed to this incremental kind of dynamic at an age when most kids, of course, were not exposed to that, how you you took that as value. And one of the things that I hear often when listeners are asking, you know, how do I take the first step in my why not now when I don't have the financial stability or I can't, you know, leave my job per se? And so two-part question. One, when you first started your sweater business, how did you answer that question? Did you go out and raise a little bit of money? How did you get over that hurdle? My brother and I had made money selling these sweaters on college campuses and had other jobs. And my father uh, gave us a loan of 10000 and we had 10000 And And by the way, 10000 was a tremendous amount of money. First shipment of sweaters that came in were 10 times too small. And, and that's the period where you're devastated uh, that you think for the rest of your life, you're going to have to pay the $20,000. And, and I looked at those sweaters on a hot August day and a small child couldn't put them on. I said, we are going to find a way to sell these sweaters. We will change fashion, tell girls to put on, you know, short sweaters and, and damn, we we're, we're able to do it. So I think one, it's never as dark as you think Two, take a risk. Don't be afraid to ask family members. And in today's world, be very careful and start with very little money. You can do with a lot less. You don't need to have a lot of money. And every time your knees shake or you wake up in the middle of the night with sweats, try to take a deep breath and say, I believe in myself. And I am sure with tenacity and a heart and with a good idea that I will succeed. Love that advice. Absolutely. I, I hear that more often than not from investors too and that and entrepreneurs that really be careful of how much money you take on. And it's so key. And as far as your scenario, you had another job. And I think there's this interesting uh, disbelief that you need to quit everything you're doing right now, quit your uh, comfy corporate job and do a 180 and make your big change. And that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times they're par- parallel. Um, and in that, in your case, it sounds like you had another job and you grew this other side of things and eventually it became big enough where you didn't need another job. Really? And, I, and, and, you know, back then I was, you know, 21 years old. So I would deliver wine on weekends or whatever I could. I mean, in the car we drove around and didn't have reverse. We had to move it out of the parking lot. My brother had to push it out. But guess what? It gives such great pleasure. And then lucky for us, our business exploded and um, became a very large business. Of course, we didn't know what we were doing. It was kind of just we understood fashion. And for the next 20 years in that particular business, we had lots of ups and downs and and moved on to creating Tory Burch, as you know, and the Faena Hotel in Argentina and Poppin and investing in boss water and, and all these great entrepreneurs, whether we create today or whether we start a creation and then fund that creation, the quality I love to have is the entrepreneurs have to have positiveness, but they must have fear because if they don't have fear, if they don't have fear, then it won't keep them up and it won't drive them. So it's natural to have fear. So I think, For your show, most importantly, which I love about your show is lots of people sit at home and want to start a business and they have fear and they're anxious and they're panicky and and they think, oh, my God, what if I lose everything? I'll never be able to find another job. And I say, don't be afraid to uh, put your foot in the water and be careful how you put it in. But it's pretty darn exciting once you make once you make that move and it's yours. Great advice. And thank you so much for shedding some light on on those tips. And as we switch gears for just a moment, and let's talk about creativity and and let's talk about branding, personal branding. You invest in in people, I've heard you say, and in humans. And what are your some of your thoughts around where creativity is going and what you've seen with your career? 
the definition of creativity. I mean, you are involved in so many different things from real estate to obviously fashion, uh, you name it. Let's talk about creativity. Well, I, I think, look, to me, I think the world, uh, the world in the next 20 years is going to be broken up. There's going to be a tremendous amount of need for engineers and people like that. And then you're going to have an extraordinary need for innovation, for disruption, for creativity, for communication. And that is going to define to some people's success. And when I talk about creativity, some of us are born with creativity. You know, we come out of the womb as a superstar creatively, meaning we're asking questions, we're curious, we're trying to figure out a solution, you know, problem solution. We're like, whatever age, you know, wouldn't it be cool if that LED sign, instead of being in three parts, was in one large part? Or wouldn't it, wouldn't it be cool if a picture frame was in a cube? You know, little things that have no, no bearing. Um, so I think the key to creativity is, one, be very curious about everything. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I think people are very scared to ask questions that they'll be judged. Two, creativity becomes more and more honed over time the more you watch the interaction you have with others and the way everybody else has is 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 walking so one great idea is go to a, to a place where there's a lot of people walking around and spend an afternoon just watching the way people react to each other all of creativity is is i have an idea and then how does that work back with people and what are they like what do they want what are they feeling? And then you've got to take your thinking, your ideas, and look at look at groups of people as they develop. And so I used to go for many, many years. Uh, I'd be in New York City, and there was a church up in the Upper East Side of New York City, and I'd sit there for four or five hours and just watch the way people walk by. Uh, I played that game with my kids. What do you think they're thinking about? What do you think they're doing? Who are they? And over time, you'll get to know humans in a much better way. And you'll use that knowledge of the way they think and what they do to create unbelievable companies, amazing products, and actually have very strong um, interactions with people. And, and that's going to be the funnest thing in life to do. I love that you're kind of known as a creative investor, because a lot of times those words don't necessarily go perfectly together. You think of investor, you think of very analytical, numbers-driven science and creativity being more art. But you found this balance, clearly. And when you look at your investments, what do you think is different as a creative individual about you when you're analyzing potential deals versus maybe someone who is just very analytical and doesn't have a creative bone in their body per se, even though that's a myth. Well, I, I think people that invest like me or care about young entrepreneurs, the first thing I do is when I, you know, take a look at what they're saying, you know, sending me and my team does, I then when I meet them, I spend at least a half an hour on how they grew up. I just want to know what's their mom like, their dad like. I want to know who they are, what drives them, how do they think. Are they people that just have are inspired? Are they tough? Are they weak? So the first thing you do to invest in create with creativity is actually use that creativity, understand who you're putting money behind. The second thing is, which is the most exciting part of it, is is there an interaction between me and the person I invest in where one plus one equals a hundred? So instead of me walking into a boardroom and looking at the numbers or anything else. I'll walk into a creative meeting and they'll present me something, uh, whether it's designing a shoe and they'll say, oh, I want to do letters on a shoe like love. And I'll say, well, I like that, but that was done last year. How do we three-dimensionalize that? Wouldn't it be cool if we did love with a little piece of, of miniature green grass and people would see love and it make them smile and make them laugh? So creativity is about taking the things around you from a product point of view, from a people point of view working with your entrepreneurs to make products better, ideas better, eight PR better, everything. And what I like to invest in is open entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs that don't have all the answers. They found spaces that a lot of people are not investing in and they are passionate with high integrity 
They put their customer first, they put their partner second, and they put themselves dead last. And it starts out with who they are and being an investor with creativity. That's what I look for. Very unique. I've never heard of an investor that out of the gate, they really want to spend 30 minutes at least talking about how someone spent their early years. That's that's very cool, and it speaks volumes to your approach. What's the number one pet peeve that you have when people come in, pitch you, want you to join them, partner up, and you see them do X, Y, Z, or say X, Y, Z, and it's a complete turnoff? Well, uh, the first thing is like, like the first thing, and sometimes you know I have to have meetings because it's the right thing to do, uh, that I'd say to all your entrepreneurs, uh, don't always think of a product that you want to make for yourself because that seems to be the problem and think about a market that's wide open. Extended living is going to be the biggest market in the world. And I've not had one person pitch me on how they can be integrated into extended living. Uh, what tends to happen and really upsetting is everyone comes with a idea and a copycat idea. So the number one thing to do is when someone comes into me, has an idea and says, we're going to be the next Google, we're going to be the next Uber, or we're going to be the next this, I'm immediately turned off. If someone comes in and goes, I'm going to make someone's life so much better. I am so passionate about this. Can you not see, can you not visualize what this new idea is going to do to change the lives of people? So I don't like copycats. I don't like name droppers, and I don't like people that don't have innovative and disruptive ideas. Got it. And talking about, well, we'll kind of shifting for a second to the brand of Tory Burch. What was one of the biggest lessons that you took away from the earlier days of of co-founding Tory Burch, and then of course the the growth has been phenomenal. But what are some of the the pain points that happened early on? So uh, you know that was that's a really interesting story, and I don't know if anyone really understands. Tory and I were uh, Tory was in the fashion business, and obviously I was in the fashion business for twenty years. And and Tory came to me and said, "Look, I'd like to create a new fashion company, and I'd like to do it um, under this other person's name." I encouraged her to do it under her own name, and we went through a lot of, of time to figure out how we could do it from a legal perspective and whatever. We started off in our apartment. We had basically no staff. We, we had like a part-time designer. I had a lot of experience in, in, in all those businesses. Tori had a lot of experience in branding. And we put together a very small team. Again, we didn't want to spend a lot of money. We were able to go direct sourcing for very small quantities, which is rare. And then we created right from the beginning, a very interesting brand where we used, um, you know, bright colored doors. We used, it was a very beautiful store. And, um, to Tori's credit, I was thinking maybe we want to open up the Upper East Side and Tori said, no, let's take a little street on the side of the road, Elizabeth street and open a store. And the day we opened, which is amazing. All of our friends came and everyone I knew and everyone Tory came and everyone fell in love with the product because we priced it right. And so we were off and running for the very beginning. Um, um, and then the next thing that happened really is Oprah was very excited about Tory and what she was doing. And, and that was a extraordinarily important to the brand. And then we, you know, as that, de- as we developed the logo and we understood the power of the logo, we understood how to make it a little bit bigger and how to work with the logo and to make sure that we kept the brand very true to itself. And Tori's done an extraordinarily good job on making sure that the brand worldwide and internationally is a, a super brand. And, and the business is, you know, like any businesses, you have small, small ups and small downs, but a number of things came together that actually made Tori at, be there at the right time and for us to be able to expand World Ride. So in terms of, of you know challenges and pain points, I'm sure there were some, but there, were, there aren't any big things that, that stand out in your mind. Well, I mean, obviously, when Tori and I went through a divorce and we disagreed on strategy in the company, that's, you know that's a very difficult point and it's very painful. And when your partner is with 
uh, someone that you were married to and you talked about it every day and then you decide that marriage won't work, um, that that's a very difficult period. And, and, but I'm proud to say that Tori and I both got through it pretty well and that the company continued to grow. Um, and leadership was brought in to help Tori and to help the team. And, and I segue out of the company and started new companies like Ellen DeGeneres, which I'm doing right now. But yes, of course, you know, what entrepreneurs don't realize pain points can occur a lot. Um, with the people aspect of the business. It could be not that the business is great, but it can be a difference of opinion. And that was a tough period. That's a great point. And just looking at, at partnerships, you know, out of the gate, whether you're literally, you know, partners in life as well, or if if it's more of just a business partnership, that's why we have to think things through so much when we first get started. But at the same time, congrats on being able to... Um, to you know, gracefully continue to have the the brand grow, and also continue to to expand your passion and explore your passion. Um, and let's talk about Ellen or Ed by Ellen. Um, how are you involved? Is it more from a uh, investment standpoint, or are you involved at all with the creative side of Ellen's company? Ed, Ed with Ellen is it really is a, one, a wonderful story. And um, I would say Ed by Ellen and Nia Watu, which is my hotel or my two, my, the most passion I have. A gentleman named Michael Francis um, brought Ellen to me and me to Ellen and thought that we would be great partners. And as you know, Ellen is probably, and I mean this sincerely, one of the most lovely, loved people in America. I mean, it's incredible to have a partner um, like Ellen and, and, and Ellen Portia, who's, you know, obviously part of everything as well. And when you say, Oh, Ellen's my partner, people say she's great. Isn't she? (laughs) She's so loved that no one would even want to know what you think. They want to just make sure that, that she's protected. And as a partner, as a business person, she's even better. We are, we're equal partners. We have managing partners that own a small piece of the equity, but uh, Ellen and I own most of the equity. We work for free and we work for a common purpose of building an incredible company that has many, many different categories and will be a worldwide company where we sell everything from bedding to bed, bath and beyond. And we sell shoes and we sell handbags and we're doing eyeglasses and we're going to enter many, many categories. And our relationship is built Ellen and I and Ellen's team and my team on total and absolute trust. And that is a very important thing as an entrepreneur. Couldn't be going any better because of the trust. Uh, Ellen couldn't be working any harder. When it comes to creativity, Ellen's very, very involved in every product. And again, when I sit down with the licensees and with Ellen, we also, I work with the licensees who then present to Ellen to have them think out of the box. What does Ellen stand for? What kind of products do we want? What are the words associated with Ellen? What's new in fashion coming down the road? What's new in betting? So it's a joint venture creatively between the licensee, Ellen, and myself. Very cool. I was just at the Ellen show, actually, and I got to uh, see some pretty amazing things in the gift shop there before heading in. And It's a great show, right? Oh, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I um, know one of her executive producers, so that's why I was there and was invited to... to uh, be in the audience as well. It happened to be on the day that Michelle Obama was co-hosting. But um, yeah, it's just, I have been a, a big fan of Ellen and how she has grown so authentically. And the amount of influence that such a kind person has is extremely interesting to me, especially when it comes to social media and digital media, because that's my background. Um, but it's, it's been such a breath of fresh air. It really has. And I record Ellen every day. I look forward to listening to her. It just makes me smile. Uh, even if I'm doing work at night, I'll put it on. So uh, I can only imagine having a partner like that, but also the creativity seems to be fun. Yes. Oh, well, by the way, really, this is really amazing. So when I went into this, I didn't realize, one, I didn't realize I'd get such a great partner. Two, I didn't realize the team around her, how talented they were. 
Three, I had no idea that the people in America want to support her product because they love her and she's giving them in product the same way she had TV. So it's been a real shocker to me. I'll be honest with you. I, I, I had no idea that we were just going to be as successful as we are. And I had no idea that I would enjoy working with my team and her team. And I'm knock on wood. We're hoping it becomes a big brand and we want to make sure we provide for all of our customers some of the best stuff in the world. But you got it right. She's a, she's a sweetheart. That's amazing. And talk about brand and, and personal brand. It's just been really cool to watch as a marketer as well and the timing of everything. So um, so congrats on that. So I have a couple questions for you regarding just kind of personal health and how do you keep your mind healthy? So recently, a, a while ago, I gained some weight. Now I'm on a diet. I think that's really important to be body make your body look okay. Um, um, so weight, weight was a big issue for me. So I'm trying really hard now to, to slim down. Um, I, I guess, you know, and I mean this sincerely, I, I think I have an unusual amount of energy. Um, but you know, as I've said, and I talk about this a lot, there's been periods in my life where I just collapse where, you know, I, I get down and, um, I'm traveling a lot. I have a lot of pressure on me. And there's periods where, you know, where it's a very difficult period. You know, my sister died or you go through a divorce or you have a crisis in a business. It affects you. And I think I think that as I get older, I've learned that when I feel too good and too impulsive and I'm moving too fast, it's like take a breath, take some time off, go to my resort, do something where the world slows down or it stops. And I think you go too fast and you get yourself in trouble when you're, when you're under a lot of stress and pressure. And I think the one thing I've learned over time is try not to be impulsive in those periods. And I think you just got to be very, very careful. So, um, I'm lucky I have so much energy, but of course we all get tired and, but I love what I do. I love every day creating product. It's such a cool thing to talk to you. So I feel pretty fortunate. I, I may be up on a, plane 24 hours. I actually just love that time. I get to listen to podcasts like yours. I get to sit down and and have some time alone. So I think you just have to pace yourself. Great advice. And one of the topics that I love to explore, especially with individuals like yourself, having so many various experiences in business, in life, and it's the topic of healthy tension. And I strongly believe that healthy tension is not a bad thing as long as, you know, respect is involved and there's a layer a foundation of, of mutual respect. Have you, do you have any thoughts on that topic and having navigated through, I'm sure at times, sticky situations, uh, things you've learned, tips, tricks, ways to sustain? What you, what you define as healthy tension, like an example. So, you know, disagreeing with someone, things aren't going your way or having to have those critical conversations, but still, and sometimes they're very intense, but still having a level of respect to where they're productive uh, versus the opposite. Yeah. So by the way, this is one of my favorite subjects, Amy, and one of my favorite subjects. I don't describe it the way you do. (laughs) How do you describe it? I describe it that any business or anything you do in life if you're not wide open for conversation and debate, if you're not extraordinarily open to say one plus one equals a hundred, and because I may feel that I want to open a hotel in, in Panama and you want to open a hotel in Brazil, there should be an intense conversation and a debate by the conversation. And there should be, it, it should be incredibly thing and it should be layered because CEOs that run an autocratic business and tell people what to do all day long without debate are not going to be successful. So for me, it's about collaboration. Collaboration caused tremendous emotions. And it's, it's, it's when all that, you, you mix it up all in a blender, hopefully you come out with a juice that tastes just great. And I think by that tension and by that conversation, the best solution will come about. And I and actually just set up like 25 meetings with all my different companies because I want to have creative tension meetings where 
they have created product and I, and I've been traveling so much. I see new ideas for product. So to sit with them and say, creatively, I like what you're doing, but I have a better idea. What do you think? They can take that idea or not, but I want them to be able to debate their position. So I think it's the best thing that can happen where it breaks down is if you have two hard heads that aren't open and they both start screaming at each other, now nah, my opinion's right, no, my opinion's right, and then there's a log jam. So I think you got to have the right group. I love that, creative tension meetings and kind of having that full disclosure expectation of there will be some healthy tension, so just be prepared for that. And kind of expecting people to stand up and and strongly uh, support and debate their their views is back their position Mm -hmm. and the best thing will come out of that i mean the best that's all all great companies are made i I don't i mean know-it-alls we don't we're not in the world know-it-alls anymore and is there something that you've been thinking about doing chris that you haven't done yet maybe it's something you've been thinking about for a long time maybe it's something that just popped up but are we in a spot where you are currently asking yourself why not now, or you think you should? Well, so first of all, I think, I think one of my problems, um, is I am the definition of why not now, because I would say that in the past I would have an idea, believe in that idea, and I would just launch it. And I would look at fear in the face what I've learned now, and, and, and by the way, depending on when I launched it, the ideas were always good, the concepts were always good, and the investments usually are good, but it was really about the execution. So for me, why, my why not now is why not go find extraordinary people to work on some new concepts, and i.e., uh, I want to build the coolest extended living communities in the world where I build it like I do my hotels, where I make it much more than just a place where people retire to, but more of a place where they teach others and they learn. So I'm working on that. And, you know, uh, there's other issues that, you know, there's other things around the world that I would love to get involved in, um, that are interesting and unique. I'm extraordinarily interested in biotech, but I have no brain to understand it. So one of the things I would love to do is to go to conferences and understand what's going on in medicine and all that kind of stuff. So those are the two things in the future that really interest me and really make my life would make my life better, you know. And I'm fortunate because the people that work for me, I have time to do very interesting and new and wonderful projects, like like having you interview me, which is fantastic, by the way. Well, it's mutually fantastic. I'm excited to. To have this conversation and with with your very first step, with either of those why not nows, you know, exploring the extended living space and even biotech, you mentioned attending conferences would be one of the first things you would do. Not an ex- So for me, so I'm not a conference guy at all, actually never been. I'm actually much more of a podcast guy. I don't know if you've felt this way, but I tell all my friends, I've probably learned more in the last two years by listening to podcasts than I did in my last 38 years. I do go to the TED conference. I find that interesting. Uh, When I said conferences, I think because I have no understanding or learning about biotech, I want to understand not from a business perspective, but just what's going on in cancer. I'd love to hear uh, whether it's from my philanthropic desires or whether it would be something I'd invest in. But that's more of like going to school and learning with no purpose. As far as extended living, my advice to everybody is take take a look at that space. It's going to be a great space. I want to enter in the luxury space because I love luxury and the branded space. And I want to think about it internationally and domestically. So my first steps when I do all of that is I find everyone I know that knows somebody that knows somebody. I get it on an airplane and I ask them about their life. I ask them about what they've done, and then I ask them about the space. And by the time I leave, I've learned more because I know them. And when you string all those pieces of information together, you then go out and build the data around it. And once you've made the decision where you're going to do it, how you're going to do it, 
you go out and you find the best management team. So for me, it's about using people I know that know the industry, having conversations about who they are, pulling it all together and then getting the data and then going ahead and doing it. I love the theme and this trend that I'm hearing from you of when you're researching, when you're learning and and immersing yourself into something, you're immersing yourself into the stories of who people are. And that helps, obviously, you come to the conclusion of of the other aspects of what you're looking to learn. But that's that's interesting. And it's something that I haven't heard often. And I think that that's really unique and a key takeaway here. Um, a couple of rapid fire questions. So what are you reading right now? I'm just listening to podcasts. I don't really re- I read magazines and things and I listen to podcasts nonstop. What are your favorite podcasts then? Uh, I, I, I like Here's the Thing with Alec Baldwin. Um, I love crime shows, 48 hours. I love your show. I love, I love the, the, or the politics I'm really getting into, This American Life. I'm actually running out of them. <laughs> Just really like them. I, I actually think and I believe all of us are going, and you know because you travel in the air a lot, and you know when you're tired, that when you put a podcast on, as long as it's a good one or a good interview like you do, you you really, it's more fun than watching a movie, if you ask me, or a TV series. It's just your brain's allowed to just think and to envelop and to have fun. So um, I'd rather do that than to read long books or anything else. You know, I really have not read a, a book for a very long time. Fair enough. That's very interesting. And I love that you said you've probably learned more from podcasts over the last two years than books and other things the last 38. That's pretty powerful. So that's... Um, I don't know if people understand it, but or, you know, if there's enough people to do any surveys on it, but it's, wow, you're com- don't you find that your ability to converse in a and be creative and think and have fun at a dinner party, you have so much information at your tips. You can yeah. talk about any subject matter. Real time and, and just that knowledge exchange, uh, not waiting on publishing and books. And it is. I, I love to listen to podcasts while I'm walking. I have one of those treadmill desks, and it only goes to about four miles an hour. Yeah, so I have that one for me here. And, and do you like it? I do like it for certain things. You know, I, I can't sit down and – and uh, write a blog post or analyze numbers while I'm doing it, but I can do quite a few other things. Are you on it right now? No, I'm not. <laughs> but I might try that sometime. This recording, I do a lot of um, phone calls and and types of things while I'm on. Um, so, next question: What keeps you up at night? I mean, it's like anything with anybody. It's like um, I mean, by the way, everything with me is in very big waves. So there's, you know, it's it's um. You know, I there's times when I have so much stress, everything keeps me up, and then other times I don't have a lot of stress. My show, I have six kids. You know, when I'm dating different women, I'm dating uh, my life of my children, life of my personal life, friendships, uh, worry, concern about some people that have some diseases, stuff like that. And on the business level, you know, what keeps me up is when businesses are really good, are we really doing enough? Can't we do better? And when businesses are struggling, how do we make them better? So I guess I'm never really, I'm always proud, but internally I'm not really content. And I never look back on something I've accomplished. I'm always looking forward to what I want to do or what I am doing. Pirates or ninjas? Who is tougher? Ninjas. Ninjas, huh? And why do you think? I don't know. They're just more soulful, smarter, tougher. I'm just different. Fair enough. Fair enough. And last question, what advice would you give to your younger self, Chris? And you can choose which age this might come at. Mm, Okay. This happened to my younger son. So it's actually something. My 15-year-old son, there was a, a debate on a subject at school. And he was on the conservative side of that debate. And actually... I think his debate was extraordinarily good. And the teacher didn't feel like that they felt that he was a bit too, um, so I'd say 15, that that he was a bit too aggressive in coming back. He had a very conservative point of view. She had a very liberal point of view. 
And then I listened to both sides. I listened to Sawyer tell me what happened. I, I listened to the letter and I came to the conclusion that the most important thing in the world is going to be communication. And it's the way in which we communicate. And if I was telling my younger son or I was telling any human today, the beauty of the human voice, the beauty of communication is going to be the thing. And the one piece of advice I'd give everyone as a younger self is see who's on the other side of the conversation, use words that people understand, use tonality that people understand. And when debating any issue, don't do it with anger, but do it with a soft sense of working the conversation. And I think the winners in the future <clears throat> are going to be the people that know how to ask questions know how to communicate, and know how to be creative. So at 15, I would give myself advice, please, please listen, don't be too impulsive, and use communication as a way to get as far as you would like in life. That's wonderful. I love it. And thank you so much for taking the time with me today, and it's fun getting to know you. I look forward to following all of your companies. And I have learned so much from you with this conversation, and so will the listeners. You can learn more about what Chris is up to and the companies he's involved with if you go to birchcreativecapital.com. And a little bit about this social media detox that I'm going into right now. So one week, no social media, I'm going to do a bit of a cleanse. And the genesis of this was really just because I realized how fatigued I am by scrolling and how much time I'm spending on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and even LinkedIn. And I think I need a bit of a reset. There are a variety of different kind of reasons beyond fatigue, one of which is just thinking about kind of what we post. And on this show, I've talked quite a bit about the fact that most of us tend to show our highlight reels instead of our real life on social media. And um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, but I think after a while, we become more prone to comparing ourselves to each other and everything is edited. And that's just not real life. So if you're spending a lot of time and with my, what I do with my job and, and my background, <laughs> I have been historically involved in digital marketing and social media. And so I spend a lot of time in these channels and I'm just needing that healthy kind of recharge. So when I come back after a week of no social media, then I will have, um, had some time to think about some new ground rules for myself. So if you're feeling the same, join me. You can go dark for a week. I promise the world will still turn without us and go on. Um, but I think it'll be a great kind of time for reflection. I'm intentionally not doing this during a vacation. It's going to be during a normal-ish. I'm using air quotes when I say normal because what is normal? But a, um, a fairly routine week for me. I will be working. So it should be quite eye-opening and I'll write a lot and we'll see how it goes. But I have some um, preconceived notions of what might happen, but I'm trying to let go of those. So if you're feeling the same need for a reprieve, then you can call it quits for a week as well. And let me know how it goes. I want to hear. Reach out to me after a week <laughs> because I won't be on social. And uh, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. I want to hear what your why not now is. Please share it with me on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at Amy Jo Martin. I'll send a signed copy of my New York Times bestselling book, Renegades Write the Rules, to the first 200 people who listen, rate, and leave an honest review of the podcast in iTunes. And you'll also get a free month subscription from our friends at Headspace. This is only available to Why Not Now listeners. Once you've left a rating and review on iTunes, just email your iTunes handle name and your mailing address to whynotnow at amyjomartin.com and we'll get your package in the mail to you. 
For detailed show notes, head to amyjomartin.com forward slash why not now. That's where you'll find links to things we discussed on the show, special offers, and how you can keep in touch with guests. Hat tip to my buddies Ash and Devin at Rock Salt Music for our tunes today. You just listened to the talented John Coggins in Let's Go and Let It Ride. And a jump high five to my talented husband, Richard Gruer, for producing the show and being patient with me. See you next time. Until then, why not now?